Funding for this episode of Buzz is made possible by the Virginia Film Office. Virginia is for film lovers. And Partners in Financial Planning, a Southwest Virginia-based financial management firm, with additional support by the American Advertising Federation of Roanoke. I hear from prospective foster parents all the time, I don't know how you do it, I would get so attached, I think it would be so hard. And I always just say, the attachment is the point. The children didn't ask for the hard in their life. And if we can sacrifice a little bit of our comfort to make something a little less hard for a young person, then that's a sacrifice we should make. They're not the rich and famous. Their profit comes not from the thing they sell, but the good they do. Our nation has more than 1.5 million nonprofits that employ one out of 10 Americans, providing services that otherwise go unfulfilled, keeping our community connected when all else fails. But nonprofits often lack the tools to properly promote themselves, to inspire more donors and volunteers and clients to their cause. That's where I come in. I've been in the nonprofit world for nearly 20 years. I connect nonprofits with marketing professionals who donate their time and expertise so that, at the end of the day, these life giving organizations can do more, do better, by creating more. That's right. Buzz. Situated on the border of West Virginia, rural Giles County, Virginia possesses uncommon natural beauty. Soaring cliffs and scenic valleys, all etched by the gorgeous New River. On the human side though, Giles County has an all too common problem here in Virginia. It has far more children in foster care than foster families able to care for them. So why are we here nearly 100 miles away in Franklin County at a horse riding center? That's the story we're telling on today's episode of Buzz. Well, my name is Katie Poff, and I work with um, Giles County Department of Social Services, and I'm a Family Services Specialist. My name's Carol Allen. I'm the Children's Services Act Coordinator for Giles County. I'm Chris McLaurin. I'm the County Administrator here in Giles County. What's the most important thing I do every day in my job? So, uh, what do we do for kids? And we, we try to focus on that every day. They're not caring for the child because they're um, using drugs or, you know, mental illness um, leaves them incapable of fully caring for the child. Child starts missing doctor's appointments, school, um, sometimes domestic violence, we see a lot of that. Um, parents fighting and the kids are witnessing it. Um, unfortunately, sexual abuse, things like that will bring kids into care. There's no way for our current six homes to accommodate 32 foster children. Um, so when our local foster homes fill up, then we have to look at private agencies for foster care placements. Um, so when that happens, we have very little control over where our children get placed. Um, so currently, we have children who are placed in Carroll County, Amherst County, Franklin County, um, you know, places that are an hour or more away um, from where we are right now. While there are opportunities outside of the county, uh, we, we don't want kids to have to leave their school, to leave their friends. You know, the trauma associated with that is tremendous. Uh, they're already going through enough issues. If a, if a child needs to go into a foster home, there's a problem somewhere. So they are obviously dealing with other issues. So just last night we had two children come into care and they were placed in the Roanoke area, which is about an hour away from Giles County. So not only has their life been uprooted, you know, they're not seeing their parents. They have to start a whole new school while also adjusting to being in foster care. Um, and if we had more homes in Giles County, they could have easily gone to school today, you know, or maybe tomorrow at least, and try to get a little piece of normalcy back to their lives, because at least that's something, you know. And sometimes the, the, their closest friends are at school, and now they're probably all wondering, you know, what happened and things, so it's really tough on the kids. It's also difficult for our social workers, um, because we only have three social workers in Giles um, who are responsible for all 32 foster children. Um, so it's difficult to be, for them to be able to have a relationship with all those children when they have to drive two plus hours to be able to meet with one. It's hard for parents to want to engage in all these services when you know they may not even be seeing their kid that often. And I understand that. I mean, I don't know that I would even want to, why do I want to go to all these meetings and all these counseling appointments and things like that when I haven't seen my kid in two weeks. If the children are in Giles, it's easier to even do visits at the parents' home and the um, children can start be up building that relationship back where they would be potentially living. Is that the ultimate goal? 
that's always the the ultimate goal is to reunify the families. That's what the Department of Social Services is doing when children are in foster care. You know, I never open a case where I think you know it's just they're just going to be adopted. I mean, sometimes that is what happens, and that's always happy at the end. But it's also sad too because you the parents do love their children. I think people just don't realize the need. But I think if we could tell the story about what an impact it has on kids, what the need is here, which is tremendous, and what an impact they can have on a kid's life long term, I think uh, we won't have any problem getting people. It's just getting the story out and letting people know, uh, you know exactly what the process involves. To help get the story out, one man comes to my mind, Bruce Bryan, president and owner of Five Points Creative, a foster parent himself, Bruce was part of our pilot episode in 2019 featuring the nonprofit Healing Strides of Virginia, which provides horse riding therapy for people of all ages and disabilities. What had inspired me to reach out to Bruce to begin with was his work helping the nonprofit DePaul Community Resources recruit more foster families through a comprehensive marketing campaign that included this commercial. I'm used to being on my own making up my own games. It's lonely, but at least I know what to expect. I'm not used to having someone to play with, but I'm learning. Can I be on your team? Love isn't always easy, but it always wins. DePaul Community Resources. Bruce connected me by Zoom with Jamie Sneed, DePaul's marketing director, and Giles County's Carol Allen. Our social workers have gone out to different um, local festivals and things to try to recruit. We purchased um, like yard signs and placed them basically throughout the entire county. We've advertised on social media. We've advertised on the county website. We've really gone down every avenue um, and haven't had a whole lot of success. The fact that you listed off eight things or whatever that you had done, that was impressive because mm -hmm. that's not what most nonprofit or most government organizations would do. That was impressive, but also it's reflective of the fact that this is a problem. And like you were trying to do everything you could do to solve it. And just the fact that you're willing to have this phone call is probably something too, because I know just from what Michael had told me, even though we haven't met, that this was like, Ugh, I don't really want to talk to those folks necessarily. But using a private agency is also more costly than being able to keep the children um, in local DSS approved homes. And we're a very small locality. Um, so the more money we can save, the more children we can serve. The challenge is if, if we don't have any homes, regardless of if they're DSS or DePaul or Intercept, these kids are going in residential treatment facility and that's far more expensive and far more traumatic for these kids. If you all do combine your, your efforts, um, I think there's a lot more power and it's still a big same footprint. I think the challenge is some of the trust issues, Carol, that you were talking about, that maybe the way to do this is start with almost treating this like a pilot program and then use this as a way to say, look, we got business, nonprofit, private, government, all working together to solve this problem. Hi, my name is Michelle Thorne. I've been a foster parent since 2013. We have fostered five children and recently adopted our son, Nathan, a couple years ago. Uh, my name is Liz Agnew. This is my husband, Rob, and our children, Eli and Leah. We've been foster parents since 2018. Um, we've had 10 placements and two adoptions. My name is Amy Clark. My husband and I decided to become foster parents in 2012. And our journey has been extremely interesting. <laughs> we have been foster parents to 13 kids total in and out and three we have adopted as our own three daughters. And I'm here today with my daughter, Emily Clark, <laughs> who is 19. Uh, my name's Caitlin and I'm 19. I'm about to be 20 in March. Um, in 2013, I was removed from my home and taken to Franklin County, and I switched schools, and I went to a new foster family. They, I think we were their first kids, so it was, it was definitely an experience. So my name is Nicole Price, and my husband, Chad, and I uh, started becoming foster parents back in 2008, 
And over the course of our time working with Giles Department of Social Services, we fostered six children in that time period. And we were very blessed to be able to adopt two of those children who are now permanent members of our very large family uh, where we have two other biological children as well. So what inspired you to become a foster parent? Uh, my husband and I are part of a blended family. We didn't have any biological children together. So after our children um, kind of grew up and was getting out of high school, we decided that we didn't feel like we were done yet and we wanted to give back to our community. So this is one way we decided we would do that. Um, I had um, ovarian and uterine cancer in 2006 and ended up having to have a hysterectomy. And so I had um, Allie and, and Anna, um, but I always wanted more children. And so I think just when we went into this, we went into this with, we want to foster to adopt, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's not always the outcome in foster care. You know, sometimes children um, are just placed with you for a period of time because unification is always the end result, you know, or the end goal um, in foster care. Um, but there are some children that are ready immediately to be adopted. And so when we went into this, we knew that we wanted to, to adopt because we wanted a forever family. I'm going to guess from drug abuse, I'm going to guess that's what it was, but I can't 100% say that's exactly why it was. So I knew that my parents had a hard history of drug abuse, so this, that's the only thing that I've come to, the reason why I be, had been placed in foster care. The night that we were removed, um, we went from our house to the Giles department to another department and it, we didn't get, it was so late at night, we didn't get there until like two or three in the morning before we, you know, like seen where we were staying and stuff. And then the next day it was, it was also hard because well, I hadn't slept at all. I was nervous and they were immediately talking about, you know, putting us into a new school and stuff like that. And I just wanted to go back home because I wasn't really, I was unsure of what was happening. My husband and I have four biological children between us. Um, we married later in life though and we wanted to have a child of our own and so the traditional ways didn't work for us. We decided to look into adoption um, but we decided instead to foster to adopt. Um, on actually my oldest daughter's birthday on April 2nd of, of 2018 we got a phone call for Eli. Uh, we weren't done with our foster classes yet and it was an emergency placement. Um, and we were really excited. He was two at the time, he's four now. And we went and met him the next day. Um, and we just clicked and um, decided that that was something that we wanted to go ahead and move forward with. So he came to us um, during a transition period of about six weeks. Um, and then, um, There were open homes here, but not an open home that wanted more than one or two children, and there was three of us. So they had to find a home that was open to three of us. Uh, Kira has been adopted. She was adopted by the same family I was adopted by, and Caleb was adopted in Danville. I'm, I've never been there, so I'm not quite sure where that's at. <laughs> she came from childcare, working background, had been around that a lot. I came from military and corporate and things of that nature. This was, this was different. Yeah, the joke growing up was that I wanted 16 babies. <laughs> so, you know, my mom recently was like, well, you're well on your way. That's right. Almost right. <laughs> there. So, score. <laughs> and I raised three boys, and it was just, you know, rub some dirt on it or, you know, attack that tree or whatever. And little girls, i say, pick up your Polly Pockets or something, and they'd start crying. i go, why are they crying? Why are they, why? I, you know. It was, yeah. it was a different experience. And then rolling into this, mm -hmm. and then in a way having Eli, it's uh, been a lot of um, redemption in being a, a dad that always didn't really know how to be a dad. Do you have a story that illustrates kind of the biggest challenge that you've experienced? Hold on, I'm trying not to cry. What is wrong with me? <laughs> You're great. You might have to hold on a second. <laughs> that, I wasn't expecting to have to say anything hard. <laughs> um, so we have dealt with many difficult situations, right? The, the concept of foster care is built on brokenness. And so anytime a child comes into your home, it is, um, 
it is a time of, of interesting excitement. There's a new, a new child, there's new experiences, you're there to help them, and it's all with intense love and compassion. But the foundation of, of that is that something very traumatic has happened, whether it's something they've witnessed or something that maybe they weren't even aware of was causing an unsafe environment for them. And it is really, really hard to bring a child into your home who is old enough to recognize the trauma that they've been exposed to. Well, <laughs> I've known Emily her whole life because she, I'm the guidance counselor at our school and she went to my elementary school and, and we got close there. And so then when she was in high school, um, some things happened and it came clear that Emily was gonna be coming into foster care and um, I asked, can I please be her mom? Can I please be her mom? And thankfully, that is exactly what ended up happening. She came to live with us when she was 15 years old. Um, the biggest joy is seeing the kids thrive that may have not had that chance to do that and giving them everything that you would give your biological children. Can we cut that? <laughs> no. is, is there one, we see them thrive, like how do you see them? Um, just become, like their personalities come out, they start getting comfortable with you, you're getting comfortable with them, and you just, they become like your own children. So um, sleep is definitely, you know, the really hard thing. Eli didn't sleep until we, we I think we had had him eight months. Um, you know, getting him adjusted, it started with putting him on a cot next to our bed, you know, and just reassuring him when he woke up for the 500th time that night that he was safe, that he was protected, that he was loved, that he was wanted, that he, no one was gonna take him. That was a really big fear for him. Yeah, they were really good to us. Um, as my first beach trips, um, my first trips to an amusement park, we were definitely spoiled and given everything that we could have asked for there and it was definitely a fit. And we call, we call them mom and dad. Still to this day, we call them mom and dad, so they're really good parents. Um, it was easier by having teachers there that already knew my situation and I didn't have to move and didn't have to explain my reasoning and stuff like that, so it made things a lot easier. And I have a great support system at my school. Friends. Yeah, I have friends and teachers. I hear from prospective foster parents all the time, I don't know how you do it, I would get so attached, I think it would be so hard. And I always just say, the attachment is the point. The children didn't ask for the hard in their life. And if we can sacrifice a little bit of our comfort to make something a little less hard for a young person, then that's a sacrifice we should make. Um, well, today I'm expecting my own. Um, I'm gonna be a mom in two months, and uh, hopefully um, we'll have our own house soon. And I have a really good job, and I'm doing my CDA license and moving up and looking into college. So I think overall, foster care gave me like a better experience and a better look forward in life. The biggest joy is having children back in our life and our house had three bedrooms that were empty. And that was silence lots of the time. It's not ever silent now. I was gonna say it's not anymore. <laughs> it's always exciting. It's always chaotic. There's a lot of things going on, but there is so much joy in having children around in interacting with children and doing things as a family. And it's brought my husband and I closer because we've gone on this journey together. I mean, one of the hardest things about this journey is to not have answers. Along the process, you are smothered in unknowns. And the unknowns are okay, you have to get very comfortable with that uncomfortable feeling. And you have to know and trust that you're making whatever difference you can in the most traumatic moments of a young person's life. Even if it's for an overnight stay while they're on their way to another home, or whether that, that child becomes a permanent member of your family, you have to know that however long you have them, that that attachment will, will and can make all the difference in the world in the direction of their lives. When you think of mine, who do you think 
Why is that? Uh, because she shows me the affection side of uh, what a mother should be like, and I've always thought that was the coolest thing in her, is that she always loves me no matter what happens. When it really hit me, and it hit Liz too, when he started really knowing that he was here, he wasn't leaving, we weren't leaving, and <laughs> you know, I say my menopause. Mm -hmm. uh, man uh, moans. Uh, my man moans. My man moans have acted up during this, this process a lot too, kind of softened me up. Um, when he looked and said, you're my, or, you're my mommy and daddy forever and ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Emily has so many talents and she has such a good heart and she's so compassionate. Honestly, all she needed was some wind beneath the wings. That's all she needed in a in a in order to just soar. There is no joy like being a mom who can look at children she did not birth and forget you didn't birth them because they're just yours. And that's an incredible feeling. The challenges facing children in foster care can be heartbreakingly complicated. Just as complex at times are the regulations, financing, agendas, and missions of the various public and private organizations working to help these children, as we learned through subsequent Zoom meetings. Even among the individuals who have these children's best interests at heart. Well, I'm not sure where we go from here but it does seem as though there is an opportunity and a need for both DePaul needing Giles and other county DSS agencies and vice versa. And maybe there's some way that we can collaborate that's just gonna, again, lift all ships here in this issue that is of vital, vital importance. I mean, the work that you guys are doing is transformative. I mean, that, we met some of these kids last week whose lives have been changed because there was a system in place to help them get out of situations that were just God awful. And, you know, into a, a new system that was like what you just said, full of that tender love and care that they needed. And they are now thriving because of the work that you guys are all doing independently and I've got to believe from a, as an outsider's perspective, we'll be able to create an even richer system if you know there's just more possibilities for collaboration moving forward. Hey, Berman. Hey, Michael. Good to see you. You too, man. Hey, thanks so much for agreeing to meet with me. So Bruce Bryan and I have been working on an episode of Buzz featuring Giles County and the incredible need that they have for more foster families. And I know that your company, Muneris Benefits, is a client of Bruce's, but more importantly for our purposes, you're a Giles County man through and through. Am I correct? Amen. Giles County all the way. <laughs> hey, so look, Bruce is coming up with this plan to really promote the need for more foster families in the county and says that he needs about a thousand dollars to help underwrite that campaign on social media and digital media. The, the Giles County Social Services Office is uh, is really right across the street from our office, and we've uh, we've we've had a wonderful collaboration with those folks for the last fifteen years. Uh, if it if it has to do with Giles County and the need for great families, then count me Naris in. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out today and joining us for this special announcement here at Healing Strides. One of the reasons why I was inspired to reach out to Bruce to begin with is because I had seen all the great work that he and his company do for nonprofits, such as DePaul Community Resources. And so uh, Bruce came on board as, and has been able to really put together a, an exciting announcement that I will let him tell you more about. We uh, did a campaign a number of years ago with Jamie and DePaul Community Resources, and Jamie was generous enough um, with the leadership at DePaul to let us recycle that campaign and tag it locally in Giles County so that we can run commercials uh, really specifically in Giles County that will be co-branded with the Giles County Department of Social Services and with DePaul Community Resources. 
We've also um, been able to get a donation or a, a contribution, if you will, from DePaul Community Resources. So with that, we're going to be able to buy 1,000 uh, local cable television commercials in Giles County. The air cover that we'll be able to get from this campaign will help the people on the front lines trying to recruit families from DePaul and from Giles County. And we're hoping that as people see these news stories and as people become familiar with this real crisis, that they'll step in and do something about it there, not only in Giles County, but wherever they're located. Because as I said, this is not a Giles County problem. It is a problem in Giles County, but it's a problem all over the country right now. So it was great to see everybody connected and working together to try to do what they can to solve this problem. We were invited here to Healing Strides by Carol Young, who is the executive director here and was featured in one of our early episodes of Buzz. And I saw the video clip and I, I emailed Michael and I said, you know, we work with Giles County and we work with DePaul. I would love to be able to help them more. What can I do to help? Uh, and so one of the things we want to do is gift to you all. Oh, wow. um, services for some of your kids. Yes, thank you. Uh, their parenting, uh, some for the kids for mental health services and or therapeutic writing, whatever is clinically needed. Thank you so, so much. So thank you for the work that you do in our community. You guys are awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.